Hello Year 12. So this is the video, the flip video on polarity. And I thought I'd start this video with a little chemistry joke for you. The chemistry joke goes, why do white bears dissolve and black bears don't? Hopefully by the end of this lesson you'll have worked out the punchline for yourself, but I'll tell it at the end anyway. And if you've understood everything in this video, you should be able to understand it. You might not laugh, but that would be your own sense of humour that's the problem. So these are the specification points we're covering today. Not too much here, but we need to make sure we get the understanding nice and firm because we're going to be building up on building on this a lot later. Okay, so let's start with a key term. That's electronegativity. Let's imagine a covalent bond. So here we've got a little diagram showing the covalent bond between two hydrogen atoms forming an H2 molecule. Each hydrogen atom donates one electron. So you have two electrons that have been shared between two both the hydrogen atoms. The hydrogen atoms are exactly the same, so these two electrons spend equal amounts of time around both uh, both atoms. Okay. We can think about the, the amount of time the electron spends around the atom as the electron density how dense the electron crowd is around the atom. So, what if the atoms are different though? So in this example, we have hydrogen and chlorine forming hydrogen chloride. We've got chlorine, which is very different to hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one proton. Chlorine has three, is into its third shell, but it has many, many protons. And because it's got so many protons, it has a much higher effective nuclear charge than hydrogen. Now, effective nuclear charge is the nuclear charge when you take into account the shielding from the shells. Okay, so how much nuclear charge are the outer electrons fielding? So chlorine has a higher effective nuclear charge than hydrogen does. And that means that chlorine is better at pulling electrons towards it. So now, in the case of these two electrons being shared, the chlorine is going to be pulling them towards it. Okay, it's going to be, they're going to be spending more time around the chlorine than they are around the hydrogen because the chlorine is snatching them away from the hydrogen. It's not splitting the bill fairly if we think about the analogy I made in the lesson. So we end up with a situation a little bit more like this. Now I want you to think of this as the electron density. This is how much of the electron cloud is around here, how much time the electrons are spending around the chlorine, how much time they're spending around the hydrogen. Now the thing about that is because there's a higher electron density on the chlorine, though in this case we've got a bromine atom, same, same story though, we've got a little bit more negative charge over here than we ha would have in just a completely, uh, a completely neutral molecule. In H2, there would be is neutral all the way around. The same amount of negative charge on every bit of the molecule. But here, we've got more electron density over here than we have over there. So there's a little bit of negative charge here. And to compensate for that, because we've taken away electrons, we've got a little bit of positive charge here. It's not a full positive charge, it's not like we've got an ion, but we have got a little bit of positive charge. And that's what this symbol here means. This is the Greek symbol delta, it's the uh, lowercase delta, and that means a little bit. So we've got a little bit of positive charge here, and a little bit of negative charge over here. Okay, so we've got two poles to the molecule. That's where the word polar comes from. A polar molecule is one that does not have a charge that is the same across all of it. Now, the fancy word for that is homogeneous. Homogeneous means the same everywhere. The charge is not the same everywhere on this molecule. There is a little bit of positive charge here, and there is a little bit negative charge here. Now, on this diagram down here, I've shown what is called the dipole for the molecule. Now, the dipole shows the direction of the uh, in, of the polar the polarity it shows it starts at the positive pole with a positive sign but the positive sign extends into an arrow which points towards the negative end so the dipole is like an arrow with a cross at the end that points from the positive side of the molecule to the negative side now because there's only two atoms in this molecule it's a linear molecule the, di the dipole is always going to be flat along in the same direction as the molecule when you have more than one bond though it starts to become a bit more complicated so here we have water. 
Hydrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. Oxygen has a lot more protons, only has one more shell, but has a lot more protons, so it pulls the electrons towards it. So the oxygen is delta negative, it's taking negative charge from both of the hydrogens, and the hydrogens are delta positive. So each hydrogen, each hydrogen oxygen bond has a dipole with a positive end here and the negative end here. But if we were to look at the dipole of the whole molecule, it would start down here where it says H2O and point straight up at the delta negative sign because these two would balance out. Now if we look at this molecule, which is boron trifluoride, fluoride is more fluorine is more um, electronegative than boron because fluorine has the same amount of shells and has more protons, so it pulls the electrons towards them. But we've got three fluorines all evenly spaced. So each one has a each bond has a dipole starting in the middle and pointing out. But if I was trying to find an overall dipole for the molecule, I wouldn't be able to. There's no negative end to this molecule and there's no positive end. The center is more positive, the end the uh, extremities are more negative, but there's no arrow I could put on this diagram to show the overall direction that the charge is going. So the overall molecule, molecule is non-polar, even though the bonds themselves are polar. And the fact that water is a polar molecule is what makes it such a good solvent for things that are polar and for ions. These negative, uh, the slightly negative oxygen can uh, has an electrostatic attraction to positive ions, and same, well, the reverse for the slightly negative hydrogens. That's why it's such a good solvent. Now let's look at some other molecules with polar bonds. Now the bonds in all of these molecules are polar. However, not all of these molecules themselves have a dipole. They not, do not have an overall polarity. So here, there is a polarity. The polarity goes, it starts the hydrogen and moves to the chlorine. Positive end, negative end. Same case with ammonia. The ammonia has three uh, positive slightly positive hydrogens, one slightly negative nitrogen which is above the three hydrogens so the polarity, the nitrogen is the negative end, this top bit here is the negative end the bottom bit in the bottom in the centre between all these hydrogens is going to be the positive end so the dipole is going to go straight up. Now if we look at this molecule which is uh, carbon, carbon tetrachloride or tetrachlorocarbon um, tetrachloromethane sorry, we have four polar bonds, however, they are all pointing in opposite directions, which evens out. It evens things out so we don't have an overall polarity. Same with boron trifluoride. However, if we take these three carbon chlorines and replace them with hydrogens, we now have a polar bond pointing upwards and no polar bond, non-polar bonds here. Because carbon and hydrogen have about the same polar uh, um, electronegativity. So we have an overall dipole going straight up, starting at the carbon, going straight up to the chlorine. The final thing we need to think about is the trend in electronegativity in the periodic table. And the trends are very, very similar to the trends in ionization energy. Because if you think about it, the ionization energy is the measure of the attraction of a atom of an electron to an atom. So any argument you can use for why something's got high ionization energy is something the same argument you can use for why something has a high electronegativity. Now the numbers here, I don't need to worry about too much, are called the Pauling electronegativities. Essentially, the higher the number, the more electronegative the atom. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table because it has the highest, it has the best trade-off between num not very many shells, just, so there's not very much shielding, and lots of protons, so there's a lot of attraction. And then as we go along this way, we've got fewer protons, so it goes a little bit lower. You see that nitrogen and oxygen are both quite electronegative, but it tails off. And if we go down, it gets lower as well because the, there are more shells, so therefore more shielding, decreasing the effective nuclear charge. So the lowest possible ones are over here, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, and the highest are over here. Now if we have a massive difference in the electronegativity, if we have something like fluorine and lithium, it's just a, th a difference in three, the, uh, um, the um, electronegative ion is going to be so electronegative it's going to take the electrons right away from lithium, and then we'll have an ionic compound. So, to go back to our starting slide, why do white bears dissolve when black bears don't? Because white bears are polar. Thank you very much.